Good morning, everyone. We're going to continue with our study on the psychological roof of marriage, which is the uh, thing that we call communication. And the scripture has a lot to say about communication, and so that is where we're going to be going with our study. <clears throat> the last time that we were together, as we were studying Ephesians 5, verse... Uh, this is uh, 25 through 32. Um, we uh, took note that in verse 26 and 27, we have the enjoyment, uh, or we have been enjoined not to give the devil an opportunity. Uh, under that, we have seen that there are satanic strategies which he hurls or which he utilizes against your marriage. Uh, these uh, are many, but uh, one of them is that he tries to destroy your focus upon Christ. He tries to keep you from occupation with Christ. And uh, we have seen that there are three areas in which th this takes place. First, he tries to get you to put your eyes on people, that is to focus on people rather than on God. We saw in Genesis 20 and in Genesis 12 how it is that Abraham saw men of power to be too powerful for him to resist and as such that they were actually going to neutralize the plan of God and so he caved by uh, turning his eyes on people instead of turning his eyes on Christ. There's an obvious principle that goes with this. It's located in Jeremiah chapter 17, verses 5 through 8. won't uh, articulate the principle at this point because uh, of the time factor. The second uh, target for Satan to use against you is that he tries to get your eyes on yourself. Instead of uh, looking to the Lord, uh, you would look to yourself. And uh, we have uh, uh, noted that there was one prophet in the Old Testament who felt sorry for himself, and that uh, focused his attention on himself. As a result, he was substituted by three people. In other, way, in other words, the ministry that he was supposed to sustain for God was cut short. And the ministry that he was supposed to sustain was handed out to three other people who then took his place to accomplish God's will for his life. I suppose that uh, if we were to quantify this, that it amounts to the loss of certain rewards uh, in eternity because you did not touch the bases as you went around the home plate. You only uh, hit one base and you didn't do uh, second uh, and third. And so you are home, you have eternal life, but you don't have everything that God had in store for you. And so uh, this gives us, of course, a moment for us to pause and to wonder, what does God have for me in my life that I have now? And I don't know if you have been as morbid as I have been, but I uh, look at myself and I say, well, you know, I'm almost 70 years old. I probably have another 10 years left in me, uh, you know, unless I step out in front of a bus or eat some poison or get shot, stabbed or something. Uh, uh, I might be out hiking and I fall off of a cliff and I turn out to be a meal for a bear. Uh, whatever. But I figure I've got maybe 10 years left. In those 10 years, what is it that God has in store for me? Well, I can rule out certain things. Obvious ones, God's not going to give me any more children. I can rule that out for a number of reasons, but let's just leave it at that biological clock, as the movie says, has it's ticked its last talk. There are certain things that the Lord would have in store for me yet in the future, 
And in general terms, we would have to say that that would be to be faithful in the duty that he has given me under the cloak of a spiritual gift. And so if I were to throw away that spiritual gift, then there is something that I'm not accomplishing in God's will because I'm not doing his will. So it's kind of like a baseball uh, kid that goes up to bat and he says, I think I'll pass this time. And goes back into the dugout. Well, he didn't get the bat. No hits, no runs, no errors. Oh, it's a pretty simple score. The third, which is the item that we want to look into today, is that Satan tries to get your eyes on things. That is material things, things that are in this world. Things that glitter, that call your attention, and you want to gravitate to them. Much the same way that a moth uh, is attracted to the flame. You go around and around till you get so close that you probably will burn with it like the moth. And so there are two items under this. One is Gehazi, uh, or Gehazi, uh, the vision of the Valley of Vision. And then there is the obvious principle that goes with it. My practice has been to go through the obvious principle first and then go back to the biographical uh, profile so that we can see how that principle comes uh, to pass or how the abstract gels and it can become visible. And so before us then is the obvious principle that is found in Hebrews chapter 13 verses 5 and 6. So would you open your Bibles please to the 13th chapter of Hebrews. You're almost at the end of the New Testament. <clears throat> and you're at the last chapter of the book of Hebrews. And we want to take a look at verses 5 and 6. And this is what it says. Make sure that your character is free from the love of money, being content with what you have, for he himself has said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. So that we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. What will man do to me? So here we have these particular verses that state for us the obvious principle of keep your eyes on the Lord, not on things. <clears throat> I remember when I was just a young kid, uh, one of the toys that I wanted really bad and uh, had never seen one like this ever before was a, a chrome-plated revolver, a toy revolver. Of course, back in those days, they didn't put those silly clown noses in the front, you know, those orange <coughs> things. They looked like guns and kids played like guns got shot, they, whoop, they held their heart, fell over, kicked a few times, you know, um, became very melodramatic about it. And uh, there was this store about two blocks from my house that actually had what looked like a Colt 45 revolver in a, a, an actual holster. And I can't remember how much it was, but it was way more money than I had. So I contemplated stealing it. I don't know if any of you have ever gone there or not, but it was a pretty gun. And so I'd go into the store like every day to look at it and to admire it. And I realized that I actually could save up enough money to buy it, and I finally did buy it. And I kept, my dad didn't want me to have it, by the way. So I had to keep it hidden. And I had this cloth, like a shop cloth. And I would shine that gun up. I would turn the, you know, the cylinder. It was just so neat. It was just a lot of fun. That is something <coughs> of what is spoken about here in our verses 
in verse 5, make sure that your character is free from the love of money. Actually, it doesn't say money there. It says silver. It, what it means is things that are of this earth. Physical things that can rapture your attention and take them someplace else. I don't know. Once I got a little older, there was a 1959 Cadillac that I liked. Had those big wings. It looked like Cinderella's castle on wheels. Had the hard dashboard and had radios in it that had AM and FM, if you can believe that. I mean, it was such a technological advance. I could hardly believe myself. Did you buy it? <laughs> <laughs> Did I steal it? No. Did you consider stealing? <laughs> <laughs> Boy, we're getting down to the nitty gritty. <laughs> Why do you think you bought the gun? <laughs> <laughs> but one thing adds to another. <laughs> no, but I, I finally, I finally did get a 1956 Cadillac. And well, my dad got it, and he had his license suspended, so he couldn't drive. So he gave me the job to go to this paid parking space that he had rented. And it was my job to go out there every day and to crank it over and let it run a little bit, you know? But you can only do that so many times, right? I won't go any further, but you can only <laughs> go so many times. Okay, so you know what the obvious principle is talking about here. So let's begin with our study. The obvious principle. Many of you probably know this story. There is a story of the greedy monkey. How do you catch a monkey? Well, as we know, there are apes and there are monkeys, and monkeys are the ones with the tails. And they're, they've got a degree of intelligence. And probably the degree of intelligence is such that it is demonstrated in the way that they become greedy. And the way that you catch these monkeys is that you figure out uh, maybe a coconut, you hollow it out, make a, a hole at one end that's just small enough for the monkey to put his hand in. But once that hand becomes a fist, it won't come out. And then you put some food on the inside. And that monkey comes, he grabs a hold of that material thing on the inside, he wants to pull his hand out and he can't. And he won't let go. And the tragedy is that it happens to many of us as believers in Christ. We get some material thing, and we do not want to turn loose of it. We don't want to turn loose of it. We don't know why. Probably because we got some monkey in us. Some monkey business, at least. The closing chapter, Hebrews 13, this is the closing chapter of this epistle is made up almost entirely of exhortations. And these are exhortations to the performance of various practical duties. We don't use this language in categorical circles. We just say it's the application of Bible doctrine. But these are practical duties. That means these are things that we ought to do. These are things that we should do. And by using the word practical, it means that they are to be done with our physical bodies, not just in our mental attitudes. And so, the 13th chapter of the Epistle to the Hebrews is almost entirely uh, made up of exhortations to the performance of various practical duties. Although the writer of the book of Hebrews or the epistle of Hebrews is unknown, nobody knows who wrote it, there are those who believe it was the apostle, the apostle Paul, but it seems very unlikely, but there are those who hold on to that. We observe the similarity with the Pauline formula for epistles. And what the apostle Paul does is that when he writes an epistle, in the first part of that epistle, he writes the doctrine. And in the 
second part of the epistle, he writes the application. And so let me give you a couple of examples. Ephesians chapters 1 through 3, chuck full with doctrine. 4, 5, and 6, application, application, application. First half, doctrine. Second half, how do you apply what you just learned? If you learned it, you got to learn it before you apply it. Philippians chapters 1 and 2, doctrine, 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 doctrine. Chapters 3 and 4, application, application, application. There are those of you who are coming to the Romans class. What are, was it that we are going to notice? We're going to notice that the book has 16 chapters. 11 of those chapters is doctrine, 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 doctrine. I mean, there is so much doctrine in it. It is so rich. It is so intense. It is so dense. Then we come to chapter 12. I urge you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. Whoops. He has now slipped the doctrine or the application of the doctrine upon us. So chapter 12, 13, 14, 15, and 16 is application, application, application. That is the way that the Pauline epistolary structure works. The first section of the epistle is teaching, and he gives you the details, the theological details of what he's teaching. The second part of the epistle tells you what it is that you should do. Okay. Number three, there are eight exhortations in Hebrews 13. Remember, this is the last chapter of the book of Hebrews. And I've got a list up here on the screen. In verse 1, we have, well, I guess I should say exhortation. What is an exhortation? There is, in grammar, a certain mode of speaking. So that if I say, get the car, you say, seem awfully bossy to me. Well, that's because you just heard a command. But if I say, let's get into the car, that's also a command. But we have the word let's in front because the regular command is always addressed to one person. But when you are addressing the group and including yourself, that's called an exhortation. And so chapter 13 of Hebrews there are eight exhortations. Some of them are singular, some of them are plural. In other words, some of them are for the individual to jump in and to do. Some of them are plural so that the whole congregation, as uh, sometimes as a collective, should work at it. So the first one, Hebrews 13, 1, it says, let love of the brethren continue, period. See how that word let is in there? That's because it's let us continue with brotherly love. Okay? It's an exhortation. And so this is what you have. In other words, the book of Hebrews, chapters 1, 2, 3, all the way to 12, is doctrine, 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 doctrine. Chapter 13 is application, application, application. Okay? So we have the same structure different proportion, but we have the same structure. In verse 2, we have an exhortation to hospitality. In chapter 3, we have sympathy with believers who are held in prison. In verse uh, 4, we have fidelity in the marriage relationship. And then we come to verses 5 through 15, and that's where our exhortation is found verses 5 and 6. Actually, we go 5 through 9 is what we're going to do. Here we have the whole idea of contentment. What's contentment? Contentment is when you are at peace, when you are happy with what you are doing. In other words, you are doing and you're what God wants you to do and you're happy with it. You say, there's no better place for me to be than in God's will. And that's what you have here. The sixth item is benevolence. And, uh, and when Ernie, when you hear this, you know that we're using uh, one of your favorite terms. This means that we are to nuke with love those people that surround us. That's
that's benevolence. It means that you do what's right, you do what's good, and you do it because you love God first, that's your motivation, and then your application is your love for your fellow man. After that, we have obedience to those who are entrusted with the office of pastor-teacher. Find that in verse 17. And then, in verses 18 and 19, we see that there is this exhortation for the congregation, for these people, to pray for the person who wrote the epistle of Hebrews. He says, please, you know, for those of us who wrote this, and he uses the, uh, a plural, which is sometimes called a majestic plural. And uh, so this is the, um, these, this is the list of the eight exhortations that we find in chapter 13. Brotherly love, that means that in, within the congregation that there's supposed to be a special affinity one for another. This isn't always true in many uh, congregations. There sometimes is someone that is not well liked by somebody else. And uh, oftentimes um, that not liking someone is covered by the false cloak of the doctrine of privacy. Oh, I don't want nothing to do with that person, doctrine of privacy. That is immaturity. The scripture here makes it quite plain. Brotherly love is to continue. That means it's supposed to grow. When you say, I don't want to get to know that person, that means that you're putting a stop, you're putting a break, and you're screeching to a halt, and you say, this is as far as I'm going. Well, that'll be as far as you'll go in your Christian growth. Second is hospitality. And verse 2 says, do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. For by this, some have entertained angels without knowing it. And so now we are introduced to an aspect of doctrine that is called the angelic conflict. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 9, we are told that it is like if, as if we were inside a stadium and that we are playing football with the opposing team and the stands are filled with angelic spectators. And they are watching to see how we're going to play. They're going to see whether we want to hog the ball and be a glory <laughs> hunt or whether we're going to be a team player and do something which is beneficial for everybody, if we are going to try to cheat uh, when uh, uh, the ball is snapped, uh, all of those things. See? And so, in this verse, we are told that as believers in Christ, that we need to open up our homes and our hearts. Because sometimes that strange person that comes is actually an angel who is watching how you treat a stranger who comes to your home. And I'll tell you, it's a very sobering thing because it may not be that the visitor is the angel, but the visitor is bringing the angels with him. And they are watching to see what you're going to do. There are some believers who say, my house begins at this door and what goes on in here is just me. The scripture says, no, this house was given to you in grace, and God has given you the capacity to open up your home in grace, in hospitality, to people who come to visit. That is one of the exhortations. Sympathy for believers who are held prisoner. I don't know, I think probably the best way to get this point across is that if you've ever been at the site of an arrest and your friend is the person who's arrested, it's amazing how you all of a sudden say, I just barely know him. <laughs> oh, I just ran into him by, you know, it was a coincidence. I, we were together, yeah, but I, I just picked up, I was just giving him a ride. Hang on, hang on to those thoughts. And so this is one of the things that the Bible tells us, that we need to think that it could be us.
us that is arrested. And we don't need to be ashamed of their chains. Fidelity in marriage. This is the concept of being faithful to your spouse, but there's a lot more. There's, I don't know, I could probably give you another hour on, on this particular verse. Um, I'm keeping the, the marriage bed honorable. And there's a bunch of things that are uh, involved in that. Then we come to ours, and we'll come back to it in a moment. Benevolence, nuking the people around us with love, doing good things. Obedience to those who are entrusted with the office of pastor-teacher. And that is that you give the pastor-teacher's proper respect for the rank that God has given him because he has a job to do, one, and part of his job is going to take place on topside or on the side of eternity when he has to give a report to the Lord of the recommendation that he has for the people in his congregation. And so the pastor's going to say, well, you know, every time I saw him come through the door, I had to go, I hate it when he comes here. <laughs> or am I glad that this person came here? Because, you know, I know that today the Lord wants to bless him. And so that is one of the things that the pastor is going to do. And then special prayer for the ones who wrote the epistle. I don't think that needs very much of an explanation. Okay. Third, or fourthly, the epistle closes in verses 20 to 25 with these following points. There's a reflective benediction. And so let's take a look at this benediction. It begins at verse 20 and goes to verse 21. And it says, Now the God of peace who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the eternal covenant, even Jesus our Lord, equipped you with every good thing to do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Notice that this is a benediction. In other words, this is the prayer request that the writer has for the receivers of the epistle. And I don't want to let too many cats out of the bag, but notice it says, Now the God of peace who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep. And you want to know why that is that way? Because in chapter 11 of the book of Hebrews, there's a whole catalog of people who have become leaders in their particular culture, their particular society, spiritual leaders, and most of them found death. Our Lord Jesus Christ is at the head of that list. In fact, that's the way that chapter 12 begins. He is at the head of those who have been so faithful that he went to the cross and he died. But God did not leave him dead. And so this is a left-handed exhortation on the part of the writer to those who are reading this epistle where the epistle is going to be read Listen, you may have to die for your convictions in Christ, but the great God, that wonderful God, brought the Lord Jesus Christ back from the dead. And he is our leader. And may he equip you with every good thing to do his will. Whatever it is that you need to do his will, you say, I don't know, that task is too hard for me to do. But God will equip you to do that. Working in us that which is pleasing in his sight. Now take a look at that phrase because that is such a fantastic phrase. Working in us. That means that today you may not be capable to do what God wanted you to do. Monday you may not be able to, but you're a little bit better. Wednesday, Thursday, maybe by Friday you will be because God is working in you to do those things which are pleasing in his sight. Okay, so this is the benediction. Next, there is an entreaty in verse 22, and once again, this is like a command that those, uh, read, or that the readership would receive 
received with favor the content of the epistle. So verse 22 begins like this. But I urge you, brethren, so this is for everybody, see? But I urge you, brethren, bear with this word. What does that mean? I know that you won't like or that you haven't liked what I've had to say. I know that it may be stunned. I know that it may be made you smart. I mean, smart like, ouch, that kind of smart. But bear with it. Hang on to it. Don't spit it out. Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. So, verse 22. Bear with this word of exhortation. Now notice it's exhortation. Why? Because he wants something from the people. He wants an act of participation. See? For I have written to you briefly. In other words, I could have written a whole lot more. But I only wrote 13 chapters. And then in verse 23, there is the announcement that Timothy, in whom uh, that congregation had a great deal of interest, was now released from prison. Now, you don't hear very much about Timothy. And what you do hear about Timothy is that he had a timid heart. He was not like Titus. He was, you know, uh, straightforward, puts his shoulder to the wheel and just keeps marching forward no matter how that hurts. But, you know, Timothy was just as faithful. He just had a more tender personality. And he ended up in prison. And he was finally released. And being in prison in those days was no picnic. They put you in a room. They didn't have flush toilets. They maybe gave you a bucket that you could use, uh, you and the other 20 people in the room. Um, they uh, didn't bring you any food. You had to depend on somebody on the outside to feed you. And uh, if the guy next to you didn't get his food that day, he'd want you to share with him with his dirty hands because they didn't give you toilet paper either. So it wasn't a picnic. And so in this verse, verse 23, this is what it says. Take notice that our brother Timothy has been released. With whom, if he comes soon, I will see you. In other words, when Timothy comes, I am going to come with him. I will see you. It is this, this verse is one of the verses that leads us to believe that no, it was not Timothy, it was not uh, Paul, who wrote this epistle, because apparently Timothy was now a head honcho, for at least for this area, and so whoever was attached to Timothy's team is the person who wrote this epistle. And our last verses, salutation to those who were there. Verse 24, greet all, the, all of your leaders and all saints. Those uh, from Italy greet you. Grace be to you all. And that's where you have the closing. Okay, so we've looked at uh, points three and point four. Point five, exhortation number five, which is contentment. That's Hebrews 13, verses 5 through 15, is wrapped in Old Testament documentation, and therefore it's authoritative jurisdiction over us. One of the things that some smart aleck believers try to do is that they'll say, I'm not going to obey this because it's not in the Old Testament or it's not in the New Testament. And this particular exhortation is wrapped in Old Testament documentation. So let's take a look at verse 5. It says, make sure that your character is free from the love of money, being content with what you have. For he himself said, I will never desert you, nor will I forsake you. And uh, if uh, you try to look for a cross-reference, you'll find that this is not a quote. It's an illusion. And so there are those who say, well, that's not in the Old Testament. It's an illusion. Actually, it's a compilation of promises Promises that were good in the Old Testament that will be good in the New Testament. 
The number six, the bare bones exhortation is to avoid covetousness and to be content with the present things. So the idea is that if you've got $10 in your pocket, be happy with the $10. If you've got $1,000 in your pocket, be thankful for the $1,000. Be happy with that. That's why it says be content. Be content. Number seven, the exhortation is then reinforced by the promises of God which give boldness and strength to faith. And that faith is the faith that you are supposed to have in your soul. So the exhortation is reinforced by the promises of God. What promise is it? The Lord himself has said, All right, let's take a look at the obvious principle once again. Point number eight, Hebrews 13, 5, verse, uh, verse 5 and part A. The first word is the word afilarguros. In your Bible, the New American Standard Bible will have this. Make sure that your character is free from the love of money. In the Greek, the word is afilarguros. The whole phrase is afilaguros ho tropos. So the first word, and you can see it uh, on the screen. Let me point it out here with the cursor. Can you guys see the cursor on the screen? <laughs> Hopefully, yeah. Okay, this is the first word, afilaguros. And um, it's the first word in the Greek. This is a compound word. It is it is made up of three constituent members. The alpha plus the verb phileo, which means to love, and arguros, which is the word, the Greek word for silver. The alpha is called an alpha privative, which means it denies what's ahead. We use that, like for instance, with the word un, that's uncool, that's uncola, for instance. That's unpleasant. The un denies the word that follows. In Greek, it was the letter A, or the alpha privative. The next word is the word phileo, which is the word for love. And this is a word which has a sentimental accent to it. It is a word which has an emotional uh, constituent to it. And so this is love that has that personal attachment to it, and the word after that is the word arguros, which is the uh, Greek word for silver. So on the uh, periodic uh, table, you'll find that silver is given those particular letters AR, uh, because that's supposed to be silver. You say, well, what's that got to do with silver? It's because it's a Greek word. Argentina is called the land of silver, because they found a lot of silver in Argentina. And when the conquistadores were going all over the Americas and they would find something, they would give it a name, and Argentina got that name. The River Platte, or the Plata River, is given that name because there was lots of silver over there. And that's this word, Arguros. You'll notice that Afil Arguros is in the emphatic position in the sentence. And what that means is, is that it is the first word in the sentence. In Greek, they would put the first word as the word which carried the most weight at the very beginning of the sentence so that you would be able to understand this is what I'm talking about. And so, afilarguros is in the emphatic position. This word means without, or we could say free from, the love of silver or the love of money. So without the love of money. Now in and of itself, you're able to see, wow, I can understand this concept. Afu uh, arguros, without the love of money or free from the love of money. This word is found in a few other places in scripture. And let me give you the first of these is 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 3. 1 Timothy 3 and verse 3. So let me uh, turn to it in my Bible. I'll invite you to turn to it in yours. 1 <coughs> Timothy chapter 3 and verse 3. Your Bible. 
Bible, if it's like most uh, printed Bibles, it'll have a uh, encapsulated section or a banner, and it says that this is for overseers and for deacons. And uh, what this means is that these are the requirements to hold an office. And so in verse 1, it says, this is a trustworthy statement that if any man aspires to the office of pastor, uh, overseer, this is the, with the word pastor, teacher here, it is a fine work that he desires to do. Verse 2, an overseer then must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, temperate, prudent, respectable, hospitable, able to teach. And you're able to see that there are these requirements. One of them was, of course, hospitality, and that's because that's an important part of the Christian life. Verse 3, not addicted to wine. This means that he is not dependent on alcohol. He's not an alcohol dependent. Or pugnacious, that means he's not out looking for fights. But he's supposed to be gentle, peaceable. And then look at this last phrase, free from the love of money. See, that's because this is a very important part of the Christian life. And the pastor-teacher needs to exemplify that. So if you have a pastor-teacher who's constantly checking the Tao to see how he's doing, or he has the motto, you know, today I'm doing the, uh, <clears throat> I'm doing everyone I can and the easy ones twice. You know that you got a problem there with somebody who is covetousness because he wants to take advantage of people. So in 1 Timothy 3 and verse 3, we see that this is a virtue, this is a characteristic. Uh, it is supposed to be part of the character of the person who aspires to the office of pastor teacher. We're in the, the Timothy, so let's go to 2 Timothy 3 2 for a moment. Just a few pages down the line here. 1 Timothy, or 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 2. And I'll begin to read in verse 1. But realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. Okay, the very first thing that should come into your mind about verse 1 is that things are going to get a lot rougher in the future. I mean, a lot worse in the future. Because men will be lovers of self, lovers of money. See, here's our word. Apart from that, they're going to be boastful, revilers, disobedient ungrateful, unholy, etc., etc. But one of those characteristics that you are going to see uh, in those last days is men who are lustful for money. They are lovers of money. Would you now turn to Luke chapter 16, please? can love two masters, for either he will hate the one um, and love the other, or he will be uh, devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. Okay. The next verse says, Now the Pharisees, who were lovers of money, see how these two thoughts come together right here? The Pharisees, who were lovers of money, were listening to all these things and were scoffing at him. You know why? Because money talks. See? And the people who are in the world of finance are the people who scoff at Christians. Oh, you guys don't know what you're doing. Don't you know that once you die, you die? You, you, you know, there's nothing in So number five, the practical warning is that a covetous believer will be drawn into pharisaical legal
feudalism and intrigues, and that he or she will be converted into that type of sinner that characterizes the end times. So this love of money is that one thing that changes your character. It changes who you are. And this is one of those strategies that Satan uses in your marriage. You've often heard that the woman is a football widow or that her husband is a workaholic. She never sees him. Why? Because he is devoted to somebody else. And so this love of money converts you. It changes your character. It perverts you into something that you are not. Well, let me see if I got enough time to introduce the next point here. Okay, one more point. <clears throat> the second word is the word hope. And uh, you can see, here's my cursor, you can see it right there, the word hope. And uh, this word hope is a definite article. It's usually translated the. Definite article means that there is something that makes something definite as opposed to something indefinite. The definite article is used to definitely identify the word right after it. And the word right after ho, you can see my cursor up here, is followed immediately by the word tropos. Tropos. It is often translated as a possessive pronoun, as it is in our case here. A possessive pronoun is mine, yours, his, hers, theirs. And so in this case, it is a possessive pronoun. The reason is that the context is a chain of exhortations or commands. Remember, command is going to have the you singular or the you plural. And so the your, which is second person plural, which just happens to be the possessive pronoun, is the most appropriate translation. So, free from the love of money, the or your tropos. So the question is, what is tropos? Third word, tropos. Originally, this word mean. Me, uh, originally, this word meant to turn or to have or to take a direction. As a result, it came to mean a manner or a fashion or a way of life. So it meant it to turn or a direction. As a result, it meant um, a manner or a fashion, a way or manner of life. The word character, which is in the New American Standard, could be used because when you do something often enough, long enough, it becomes part of your character. Like when you first started to learn to write, you started to write with either your right hand or your left hand. So people now call you lefty because you use your left hand for writing. But maybe you were punished by your first grade teacher, maybe punished by your parents, and they said, no, you will not write with your left hand. You will write with your right hand. So you learn to write with your right hand. But when you sit at the table, you eat with your left hand because that's your manner of life, see? And so the word character could be used, but it's a little bit more difficult for us to entertain, but it's okay to use. Manner of life, I think, is a little easier for us to, um, to hold. The word tropos, which is manner of life or character, is used in Acts 1.11 in the phrase the same way. I know that this has no context, so it probably doesn't mean anything right now.
But uh, this is the scene where the Lord Jesus Christ ascended from the earth, and the angel said to the people, what are you guys doing just looking up into the air? This same Jesus that you have seen leave will return in the same way. Acts 11, or Acts 1, verse 11. It's also used in 2 Thessalonians 3.16. In 2 Thessalonians 3.16, it means that the Lord will be faithful to you in every circumstance, in every way that you find yourself. And then last of, last of all, let me give you a corrected translation. Free from the love of money in your manner of life. And uh, with that, we're going to have to stop for this morning. We'll have to pick this up next week. Let's uh, be dismissed for a few moments and come back after our break.